The police in the Thai city of Chiang Mai have a deadline to meet. Thailand's Prime Minister has promised the king a birthday present, the eradication of all drugs from the country by December, and it's up to the police to deliver. 240 policemen, some of them are in plain clothes. They're going to be looking at um, raiding three particular places and looking for drugs. <laughs> Under government orders, the police are rounding up anyone suspected of drug use and forcing them into rehabilitation camps. Tens of thousands of people have been plucked from the streets since the offensive began in February. Every local police force has been given a target of arrest to meet. In Chiang Mai, they were on course and determined to keep it that way. The Thai government says it's winning a great victory. But with over 2,000 unsolved murders, at what cost? <laughs> Chiang Mai is close to Thailand's border with Burma. The Thai government blames Burmese warlords for smuggling in the methamphetamines that feed the country's drug epidemic. We got a call early this morning from the army saying that they'd had a successful dawn ambush. So we're heading up there. It's, it's northeast of Chiang Mai. It's about 150 kilometers away from where we are now. We're being accompanied by the army to, to the place where this all happened. It's through these mountains that over 600 million tablets of methamphetamine are smuggled in every year. Out of a population of some 60 million, Three million Thais now use drugs. The government says the country is in crisis. Quite a lot of activity going on. <laughs> There's one body over there. He's covered in flies. <laughs> Looks like they've already buried quite a few there. <sighs> what the army are saying is that they actually planted, um, they planted mines or bombs into the ground. Um, they detonated them when, when they saw them all coming. So it, this man wasn't actually shot dead, but there are eight other dead bodies. The ambush had taken weeks of planning. They basically set up a sting operation. Um, it's like an undercover operation where they sent uh, one of their people in to pretend to be wanting to buy drugs from these people. So they knew where they were going to be. They told me just across the valley in Burma, the drug cartels had set up mobile factories to make the methamphetamine tablets. The border between Burma and Thailand is 2,000 kilometers long. It's impossible to, to patrol the whole, the whole area. The soldiers here use lethal force against suspected smugglers. Since the start of the year and the war on drugs, the army says it's killed scores of traffickers. Um, how many buried here? Another two fresh graves down there. They found half a million pills on, on these people, on these, nine, on these nine people. That's enough evidence for them to know that they are drug dealers. Um, he says that they, they can't do anything else with the bodies. They have to just literally bury them on the spot. And they don't know who their families are in Burma, so what can they do with the bodies? They can just leave them here. I was told it was time to go. Not all the smugglers had been captured, and those that had escaped were armed. They're worried about the, the ones that did get away, that they might come back to the scene at some point today, so we need to get out of here pretty quickly. But killing smugglers does nothing to lessen Thailand's craving for the drug. In the villages close to the border, methamphetamine addiction has become a curse. Here, they call it yabba, crazy medicine. This whole region is... Um, it's a hill tribe region. There are a lot of villages scattered around. Now, the, the area that we're going to uh, is called Mei Rim, and it's the Hmong tribe that live there. <laughs> but 
But in May Sai May, I wouldn't meet a single Yaba addict. I was about to encounter more of the effects of the government's war on drugs. I found I'd arrived in a village of children. Hardly an adult was to be seen. They told me the police had taken away their parents. Eventually, the former village chief, Sawat Tanam Rungrang, arrived. He said the children's parents had used Yabba and the police had taken them off for forcible rehabilitation. One couple suspected of selling the drug was mysteriously shot dead. Sawat had been left to look after the children. Amongst the Hmong tribe um, that live in this area, in these villages, there are 1,700 people. And he's saying of those, um, he reckons around 200 people um, are addicted to Yaba. And of those 200, um, are roughly 10% are children. So relatively in, in quite a small population, Yaba here is a problem. <laughs> I asked him about the couple that were, um, that were shot dead. Um, he said that he can't guarantee that they weren't dealers. There were rumors flying around the village, but he doesn't know for sure whether they were or they weren't. He's saying generally, yes, dealers do deserve to die, but there needs to be a fair trial, because there, there are always rumors about someone who's dealing or who they, who's not, but everyone deserves to go through a fair process. In Chiang Mai, the king's face dominates the streets. The Prime Minister's promise to such a revered figure to cleanse the country of drugs is something he has to deliver. His methods mean many drug users have fled their homes, terrified of arrest or worse. In the town, there's a drop-in centre where until recently, addicts came voluntarily for support. The place was almost empty. Just one addict lay comatose on the floor. <laughs> He's saying that, that there, is, there is this great fear amongst kids here as well, that, that they're, they're, they're scared of, of being seen here, um, that they're finding it very hard to get access to Yabra as well. He says there's pressure by the police to try and clean up this whole, this whole Chiang Mai area, and there's also pressure being put on the kids themselves by the police to for them to act as informants to give away names of other kids that they know that are dealers and users i was told that this 19 year old had been in hiding but had risked a return to his old haunt the crackdown has made yabba hard to find addicts deprived of the stimulant struggle to keep awake when he woke up he agreed to talk to me provided we hid his face he told me that he took his first yabba pill at the age of 10. So that he started taking five tablets a day, but at the moment he's taking on average one a day, and sometimes he doesn't take it at all. So his friend, who's 19, was shot dead by the police um, only a month ago. Um, his friend was a, was an addict and also a dealer. He says taking Abba has affected him uh, physically. He's, he's thin, doesn't want to eat. Um, his sleeping patterns are erratic. He has to smoke dope in order to get a good night's sleep. And mentally, um, he says he has hallucinations. He feels paranoid. So, yes, of course, he wants to stop taking it. And the government wants him to stop taking it. They set up a network of rehabilitation centers where drug users who are arrested are forced into treatment. We arranged to visit one. Just coming up to um, one of the biggest rehab centres in the north, it takes patients from um, all over the north of Thailand. The use of Yabba exploded after 1997 when the Thai economy collapsed. The stimulant allowed people to work the crucifying hours needed to survive. The recession has gone, but the drugs have stayed. It's just gone 5.30. Um, the patients here have just had their wake-up call. Now, there are, about, there are 33 um, patients all together in this small block here. So they get their wake-up call in the morning, um, and then their day is very structured. It's all, um, it's all very coordinated. Yeah.
องสองหนึ่งสองหนึ่งสิบสองสิบสามสิบสี่สิบห้าสิบหกสิบเจ็ดสิบแปดสิบเจ้าสาว Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawatra says these centres will shame and frighten the tens of thousands of people being pushed through them into renouncing drugs. We must remain honest is the mantra they recite. This is basically kind of self-ruled by by the patients themselves. There's only one nurse here to look after all these patients. So basically, it's down to the patients themselves to kind of orchestrate day-to-day, day-to-day running. Among the patients was a 14-year-old addict, Porn Chai Siri Intont. Unlike most, he'd been able to avoid the shame of arrest. He was brought here by his teacher, who realised that he had a, a problem with yaba when he was going to school. Um, he says he was quite happy to come here because he realised it was time to quit and that he couldn't carry on doing the amount of pills he was doing. Pon Chai was given his first tablet at the age of 10 by his uncle, a drug dealer. I think if I see something like the same thing, I asked him how, how realistic he was being, if he was going back to the same place um, with the same friends, with his uncle still being around, how realistic he thought he was being and staying off drugs. And he said, actually, if his friends suggested um, taking up drugs again, he probably would. And that's the potential flaw in the government's strategy. That's you. Yeah. These are just a few photos that Ponchai is allowed to have in here. One of them is actually when his classmates came to visit him and his teacher. There was one when, um, before he was brought here, at a time when he was still still taking the drug. So that looking through these photographs makes him feel sad. He remembers his friends and he mem- remembers what it was like. Before he came to the centre, and he misses his friends. We've just been told this morning that four people have been shot dead in the market area, um, and half a million yaba tablets have been found. I don't have any more information than that, so we're just heading into the market. The government says it's giving drug users a second chance. It's not an opportunity available to everyone. Since the government campaign began, suspected drug dealers have been dying at the rate of up to 25 a day. There are three bodies here. We were told there were four, um, but they only seem to be three. There are weapons. Um, we've obviously got a stash of yabra in the back. What looks like yabra in the back as well. The police say they only shoot in self-defence. This bloke was obviously shot straight in the head. Um, He's armed. The other two, it looks like they were possibly trying to run away from the vehicle. This is a police vehicle. It's obviously not marked. It's one of their undercover um, vehicles. It looks like there's a bullet hole in the windscreen there. Have any police officers been hurt? No, no. Just the vehicle. So that you decided to take to, in self-defense. In self-defense, you shot these three people dead. Compared to what we saw at the border, there seems to be a more, more meticulous investigation. They've called forensics in. There are a lot of police hanging around, a lot of army hanging around as well. It was a perfect photo opportunity for General Sant, the head of Thailand's police. Tangible proof that the war on drugs was being won. All year he's faced accusations that in the rush to meet the Prime Minister's deadline, the police have killed innocent people as well as drug dealers. Uh, I'm a, a British journalist from uh, London. Just wanted to, yes. Can I just ask you a few questions, if that's okay? Do you think that in this war on drugs, that innocent people have died? Uh, we won't shoot at people until they shoot at us first. We don't want to kill people. What we want is gather information. Our aim isn't to kill people. 
Since the government crackdown began, over 2,000 people suspected of being drug users or dealers have been killed. The police claim they're responsible for only around 40 of these deaths. The rest, they say, is down to drug gangs killing each other. But the government-funded National Human Rights Commission says the police have been executing suspects, many of them innocent, without trial. A recent opinion poll showed 40% of Thais fear false accusations. 30% are afraid of being killed. The people most frightened are those on what the police call their blacklists, lists of alleged drug dealers and users who are required to report to police stations. I'm going to see the editor of a local magazine here in Chiang Rai, who says that his name appeared on the blacklist even though he's never had anything to do with drugs at all. Hundreds of people on the police blacklist have been mysteriously murdered. I'd been told that Thanapat Wainan was living in fear of his life. Like many others, he says his name was handed to the police by someone who bore a grudge against him. This is the actual letter that he received. Um, it says that his name is on a list of known drug dealers and that he has to report to local district office. If he doesn't, then he, they will take it very seriously and the consequences will be grave. So once he'd received the letter, he said that for, for weeks he was petrified to, to leave the house. He'd heard um, reports both locally here in Chiang Rai and nationally as well of people, of people being shot dead. Um, he calls them the silent killings. They were extrajudicial shootings, and he was worried that the same would happen to him as well. It was only by enlisting the help of a human rights organization that he was able to avoid arrest or murder. When he went down to the local district office to clear his name from this blacklist, he was told by an official there that there are only three ways that you can actually have your name cleared. One is that you die of natural causes. Secondly, you're arrested and imprisoned for drug-related offences. Or thirdly, you're shot dead in an extrajudicial killing. We travel south to the capital, Bangkok. When the war on drugs began, there was overwhelming public support. Now that support is waning. A turning point was the killing of a nine-year-old boy, Chakapan Srisad, known as Fluke. I visited his grandmother and uncle. Is this Fluke here? <laughs> On the picture of Fluke that they have in their living room, they've actually had to cover up the date of his death. Um, Fluke's grandfather is very unwell at the moment, and he hasn't even been told that his grandson is dead. Fluke's uncle, Som Chai, took me to the spot where his nephew was shot. Som Chai said that Fluke's father made the mistake of selling Yabba to undercover police officers. <laughs> Fluke's father was arrested here while his wife and his child were sat in a car just on the off the street there. Um, when Fluke's mother saw what was going on with her husband, she she drove up past here and her, her son was shot in the back of the car a couple of times just as they were speeding off. She collided um, into the side of the street near, near a cinema and then fled into the markets just up here. Fluke died instantly. His father is now in prison. His mother hasn't been seen since the shooting. Fluke was a, an only child and his mother absolutely doted on him. The police insist they didn't kill Fluke. They blame unidentified gunmen. There is an investigation going on into Fluke's death. Um, three police officers have been arrested. Now, they admit that they actually aimed at the vehicle, but not at, his, uh, not at Fluke's body. They're saying that the, the ammunition found inside Fluke's body doesn't match the ammunition fired from their weapons. But some child is convinced that this whole thing is just a big cover-up. Very few of the thousands of killings have been properly investigated. I'm at the um, Ministry of Justice to see the head of the Forensic Science Institute. Dr. Pontip Rojanasanan is one of the government's most senior forensic scientists. For a forensic scientist, he seems a very kind of um, 
a flamboyant person. She's constantly protested that obstacles have been put in her way when she's tried to gather evidence about the killings. Thank you. Do you think the police were responsible for the death of that particular boy? Yeah. The Prime Minister let us investigate this case. But that's only the look around the car and uh, see the direction of the bullets. We've got no uh, bullets and no gun. So you haven't been given access to the bullets that were actually found mm -hmm. in the yeah. body? Yeah. So you can't match them to see whether they belong to the police or whether they mm -hmm. be might mm -hmm. belong to somebody mm -hmm. else? This exhibit was sent to the police department, so we cannot uh, do the second in examination of this. She says in the war I against the drugs, area, the police think, uh, have killed with impunity. Them. Are you satisfied with the investigations that have happened into these murders as to yeah. who has been responsible? No. Because uh, I saw many cases that uh, the police, they didn't care about the, friends, uh, I mean the scientific evidence. So you think in a lot of these cases the police have got away with murder? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There have been very few investigations, few no investigations. inquiries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not something that worries the government. As far as they're concerned, they're well on their way to achieving their objective. A drugs-free Thailand in time for the King's birthday in December. And this is their evidence. Thirteen thousand graduates of the government's rehabilitation program had gathered to express their gratitude to the Prime Minister. This is a sign of their saying that we welcome good people back to society. It's impossible to know how many of these people were drug users and dealers and how many were innocent people who found their names on the blacklist. But to get their freedom, they needed to go through the ritual. These two have actually been through the military camp system. They're giving a very public show of gratitude to the Prime Minister. They swore an oath of allegiance to the King and to Thailand. Drug experts are sceptical about how many of these people will keep clear of drugs once they're released. Prime Minister Taksin had a warning for potential relapses. So the Prime Minister is saying to these 13,000 people here today that you've been given a second chance, don't use it, you will not be given any more chances. He's saying that drug dealers are a threat to the nation here and if any of you fight us, we will shoot you. It's a fairly straightforward message. Encouraged by the Prime Minister's claims that he can achieve a drugs-free Thailand, neighbouring countries are adopting certain aspects of the Thai experiment. But they're proceeding with caution. For them, the deaths of over 2,000 people is too high.